happen. And uh, I also would like to thank the administrative staff of uh, this institute for the efficiency in the organization of this. So, uh, I, I would like in this talk to, to give some new results on a node problem. So these uh, results come from uh, two works. The first is uh, the externalized dimension with Raul, Seth Singer, and Roberta Wikatik, and is a preprint. And the second one is a work in progress with uh, Nyan Nguyen and Sorab Trivedi. A density of Lipschitz table map is in the boundary of the nice dimensions. As I said, it's uh, going back to the early years of singularity theory. And uh, because we, I will talk about stable mappings from smooth manifolds, N and P, and about stable families of mappings. So F from N cross 0, 1 into P. So initially, uh, fixing some notation, let's see infinite of NP be the set of smooth mappings from N to P. And uh, I give to this space the same infinite with net topology. Uh, in this talk, I essentially we will assume any, any compact, but in most of the results, I can take uh, uh, proper maps and the results uh, will be true. Okay, so if I want to talk uh, about stability, as Marcelo said, we need an, an equivalence relation, and my equivalence relation is a equivalence relation. Right? So change of coordinates in source and target. So I say that two maps, F and G, are A equivalent. If I have diffeomorphisms, H from N to N and K from P to P, commute in this diagram. Uh, with this, I can already define, so now I can define stability, and I say that a map F is stable if there is a neighborhood of F in the space, say infinite of NP, with the property that every G in that neighborhood is A equivalent to F. That means, uh, as Marcel said in his course, that if you perturb F a little bit, you don't change the qualitative behavior of F, right? So, um, I also want to define family, st uh, stable family. I say that a family F, a one parameter family from N cross 0, 1, and 2, P, is this a stable one parameter family? If for every T in 0, 1, except uh, eventually a finite number, oops. except eventually a finite number, T1, T2, Tk, the corresponding map Ft from N to P is stable. And for those exceptional bifurcation values, I want that the family is transversal to the orbits in jet space. I will be a little bit more precise in, in the, in later in the talk, right? But for a while, this is the definition. Uh, and, uh, well, let's come back here again to say the following. If I replace in this definition H and K by homeomorphisms, by weaker equivalence like homeomorphism or CL diffeomorphisms, then I have corresponding notions of topological equivalence or C0 equivalence, CL equivalence, and correspondingly the notions of topological stability and CL stability, right? That's what I say in the next slide. So, we get similar definitions replacing by homeomorphism and CL diffeomorphism, and get the corresponding notion of CLA equivalence and topological stability, CLA equivalence and CLA stability. So, at this moment, I can uh, state what uh, we can say is the original problem in singularity theory, right? So, if I denote by CL and P the subset of uh, CL stable mappings in the space say, infinite of NP, then the problem at the early years of singularity theory 
was find pairs of dimensions n and p for which this set of the stable mappings is open and dense. Of course, it's always open, but in, in, in which case it's a dense set. And of also, if possible, we would like to characterize the singularities of the set. Okay. So uh, the, goals of, the goals of this talk are go back to these problems in the way that they appeared in the history of singularity theory and bring our contribution to these problems, to the, the recent results I mentioned at the beginning of the thing. OK, so uh, we can go to a little bit of history, right? So let's talk again about uh, the first name. The first name was Whitney, right? Whitney, in the decades 40 and 50, he had this program of understanding the stable singularities and uh, proving, or not, I mean, proving that the set of the stable mappings is a dense set, right? Uh, I, I have two parents to make in this, uh, my comments about Whitney. First of all is that uh, we have these two photographs. This one, he was very young. Probably he had a position at Harvard at that time. And here he was in his 70s, and this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And at this time, uh, he was working on a project of teaching of geometry for children. And uh, he came to Brazil in that period, in 79 or 80, and I met him in São Carlos uh, when he was involved in that project, right? So this was the first parent, parenthesis. So Whitney uh, defined the stable mappings. And he was able to prove that the stable maps form a dense set in two, at least two special cases, which is the case in which P is 2n minus 1. And he characterized the stable singularities. And uh, in this famous 1955 paper of mappings from the plane, uh, of the plane into the plane, he characterized the stable singularities in this case that we all know are folds, more isolated, more degenerate singularity cusps, and uh, transverse double folds. Right. And here I would like to make the second parenthesis, because uh, as we are at IMPA, and IMPA is this prestigious institute in several areas of mathematics, but especially dynamical systems, I would like to make a parallel with the concept of uh, structural stability in dynamical systems. This concept was defined by Andronov and Potriagin in 1937. And uh, in fact, they called the uh, system grossier, so coarse systems. And uh, in the beginning of the 50s, uh, there was another paper by Debages in which he explained with more details, this paper by Andronov and Potriagin, because this was a Comte Rondi paper. And uh, this paper by Debages was found by the, our great mathematician, Maurice Peixoto, that died last year in April. And so Maurice Peixoto was, uh, well, he was uh, excited about that paper, and he decided that he would work in, uh, uh, in that problem of structural stability. He gave the name of structurally stable systems, and he studied in his paper in 1959, uh, stable systems in the plane. And in the beginning of the paper, he acknowledges, uh, he thanks to Lefschetz and to Whitney for several nice uh, suggestions. OK, so these two uh, uh, theories developed in parallel in some sense, right? So, closing this parenthesis and going back to Whitney, Whitney conjectured that for any pair of dimensions, uh, stable mappings would form a dense set. But no, so René Thon, so in fact, Whitney conjectured in 1958, but René Thon in 1959, in his lecture about singularities at Bonn, at bon, he sketched the proof that stable maps are not dense when n equals p equals 9. 
and uh, he made uh, several, formulated several conje conjectures about density of uh, stable mappings that led, led to a great development of the theory. I would like to write in the blackboard Tom's example because it will be very important in this talk. So, René um, he gave an example of a family that appears genetically. So, I can, I can write it for germs. So, it's a family, F lambda, from R9 to R9. I write the coordinates, small letters here in source, and big letters in the target. U, of course, is U1 up to U6. So X is X squared plus lambda YZ plus U1 Y plus U2Z. Y lambda XZ plus U3 X plus U4Z. Z plus lambda xy plus u5x plus u6z. And the other coordinates are ui equals to ui, i equals from a to 6. So there are some exceptional values. So lambda is different from minus 8, 0, and 1. And uh, so as I said, this is a family. Uh, that appears generically, but Tom argued that if lambda is different from lambda prime, F lambda is not A equivalent to F lambda prime. As they go together to form an open set in the space of maps, it follows from this that stability cannot be a uh, dense property in these dimensions, right? I just for the for the future of the talk, I, I just want to to uh, call the attention that this map from R9 to R9 for each lambda is an unfolding at parameters are u of this map from this map that I will call F0 lambda that goes from R3 to R3, which is a net of conics, of quadrics, it's a net of quadrics. So we have three quadrics in three variables, right? So, and uh, this family of nets of quadrics are not linearly, neither analytically uh, trivial. So for lambda different from lambda prime, they are not equivalent, right? So, uh, it was um, Mother, John Mother, that from 68 to 71 proved, uh, completed most of the conjectures and, uh, and uh, theorems uh, sketched by Henneton. So, and from the viewpoint of this talk, I want to recall these two results mother's results. So theorem A, that stable mappings, so smooth stable mappings. Uh, stable maps with respect to A equivalence are dense if and only if in NP, the pair NP is in the nice dimensions. The nice dimensions in, this is, this is N, this is P, the horizontal is N, the vertical is P, and is the nice dimensions are composed of any pair NP in this region here. So whose boundary is this piecewise linear curve here. Okay? So notice that the pair 9 and 9 is in the boundary of the nice dimension. Right? So stable maps are dense if and only if NP is a pair in this region. However, Mader also proved that if you replace by topologically stability, 
then topological stability is dense for any pair of dimensions. Okay? So, um, some years later, so 20 years later, there was this result of under the Plessis anterior wall proving that C1 stability is dense if and only if NP is in the nice dimensions. Okay, so this solves the problem for CL for NL. So if L is different from zero, density occurs only in the nice dimensions. If and only if we are in the nice dimensions. And if L is equal to zero, then it happens always. So, uh, so uh, what are our contributions? So from one side, we bring to this contest the notion of by Lipschitz stability, right? So if uh, I say that my homeomorphisms are by Lipschitz, then I can uh, formulate the concept of Lipschitz stability. And uh, we define the Lipschitz nice dimensions as the set, uh, I mean, as we say that a pair is in the Lipschitz nice dimension when the set of Lipschitz stable, stable mappings for this pair is a dense set, okay? So our result, our contribution to this problem is this theorem, it's uh, Nyan and Sorab, is the Lipschitz nice dimensions contains the nice dimensions and its boundary. So it's different from the other cases. The boundary is, uh, we, we prove that at the boundary, the stable maps, the, the Lipschitz stable maps, also form a dense set. And we have also a contribution to the problem of family. So I state the two results, and then we go on. So recall that we are calling this theorem one. The second contribution with Raul, Setzinger, and uh, Roberta, in, the, in this case, we consider families. For stability of one parameter families, there are several results, but they are, huh? Oops, sorry. Sorry. Well, it's a, a good question, right? So we don't know. Uh, we, our conjecture is that this result is sharp. I mean, if NP is outside the nice dimension and its boundary, Lipschitz stable maps are not dense. I will comment more on this later but we don't know the, the answer completely. Yeah, we don't have. Okay. We, we have candidate, uh, but uh, not completely argument, okay? We go back to this later, okay? So, concerning families, uh, the history is uh, we have less to say in the sense that there are results for specific dimensions, several results for specific dimensions. By the way, this first one here is uh, uh, proving that the set of one parameter stable families from any manifold to the plane form a dense set is a result of Eduardo Cincaro in 1978, and he was a PhD student here, and his supervisor was Sotomayor. And uh, there are other results uh, where you can get the density of stable families. For instance, from uh, Joachim Rieger's uh, results from the plane to the plane, from uh, Gurionov and Mond and Marard's results, you can get uh, the result for mappings from two manifolds and three manifolds. And uh, I also recall that there are several papers in which uh, you, you, you use 
stable families in order to prove some results about the topology of the manifold, uh, like Cerf's and Igusa's results. And uh, usually this one parameter stable families, I call the pseudo isotopies in, in these results. Right? So this, is, this picture is nice because it uh, gives a geometric idea of what is a one parameter stable family, right? So this is, uh, uh, I'm representing here the space of maps from N to P, and the F and G are two stable mappings, and uh, a one parameter stable family would be represented as a path joining F and G in such a way that this path cross transversely the codimension one strata. So uh, we had been able, in this theorem with uh, Raul and Roberta, to prove a theorem which is the analog of theorem A of mother. So we proved that one parameter stable families is a dense set. If uh, one parameter stable families is a residual set, if and only if the pair NP is in the externalized dimension that we defined and had been able to compute. Okay? So, um, now uh, what uh, I want to do is to go to some pieces of the proof of Mother's theorem. Because especially our theorem one is um, is drawing over the proof of Mother's theorem. Okay, so then I, I have to then explain some of pieces of the proofs of Mother's theorem A and B. So let's start with the first important concept. So Mother defined the, the notion of infinitesimal stability, which was, uh, as the name says, an infinitesimal notion that he proved is equivalent to, to, stable, to stability. Right? In, or in other words, he passed to vector fields. In this diagram, if f is a map from n to p, we have tn and tp are the tangent bundles. And uh, we define f star of tp is the pullback bundle over n via f. And we define the vector fields along F as the map from N to TP such that pi 2 composed with sigma is F. In other words, vector fields along F are sections of this bundle, right? And moreover, what they represent is all possible deformations of your original map F. So we, we denote by theta n the set of sections of the tangent bundle at the source, and similar theta p as the sections of the vector bundle in the target. Then the definition is the following. F from n to p is infinitesimally stable. If given any vector field along F here, I can find a section here S and the section in the target eta in such a way that sigma can be decomposed as tf of s plus eta composed with f. We have uh, the local definition of uh, infinitesimal stability that I will give in a sequence so that I can explain a little bit more the notation. So locally, if I have then germs from Rn to Rp, Right? I recall that the space of germs is uh, epsilon n modulo of rank P, where epsilon n is the local ring of functions at the origin. And uh, in the same way as before, I can define theta f as the set of, uh, set of vector fields along f. Let me just, uh, uh, in order to, to explain the definition, so F is locally infinitesimally stable. If that equation happens, 
Let me just explain here that when I write theta f, so the space of all the formations equals tf theta n plus omega f theta p, what I mean is the following. Theta f is a, a map from the vector fields in the source to theta f that for each s goes to tfs, which acts in the following way. For each x in the neighborhood of the origin, this is the differential of f at the point x, calculated it, okay? And uh, this is a, a homomorphism of epsilon n models. And uh, on the other hand, this other map in the target goes to theta p and theta f. So given a section in the target, omega f eta is equal to eta ball f. While this has, uh, these are submodels of this model with the structure of epsilon any model, this object here has only the structure of epsilon p model, model over the target, which makes this uh, right-hand side here a com more complicated algebraic object because it has the two structures. I can give only one structure to this, pulling back this epsilon p structure by f in such a way that this has the structure of f star of epsilon p model, okay? This object is naturally identified with the tangent space of the action, right? The extended tangent space. So at this point, maybe it's good that I write uh, a eco dimension of a germ for future use is the dimension, in this case, real dimension, over this expression. So we are talking about infinitesimal deformations, and it's natural that the denominator comes from uh, deformations uh, 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 associated to the action of the group R, and the omega f theta p appears as deformation associated to the group in the target, right? So when f is stable, the a equal dimension is zero, as Marcelo said in his lecture. Okay, so <clears throat> for a while, let's give this. And uh, we can state this important result by matter that gives several conditions equivalent to stability. I didn't put all of them, I just put some, right? So what he wanted was to prove that F is stable if, if and only if F is infinitesimally stable. But to prove this, he, uh, it was necessary to give other definitions and to prove that they are equivalent to stability, right? So in particular, we will need this one, transverse stability, which means the following. Uh, so he gave a stratification of the jet space by orbits of the group A in jet space. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, stratification induces a partition also in the big uh, K jet space, JKNP. And he characterizes stability in terms of transversality to this stratification. So we get from here that F is stable if and only if the jet extension of F is transversal to all the AK orbits in jet space. Okay. Well, to prove this, uh, of course, there are several tools, very important ones. For instance, just to comment, okay. 
just to comment, uh, we, to prove that uh, the equivalence between infinitesimally stable and transversely stable, we need to, to, to prove that the equations can be solved polynomially. If I am able to solve this equation up to certain order, then I'm able to solve the equation, right? And to prove this, we need preparation theorem. So it's another piece of mathematics that we need to prove this is Mader's preparation theorem, uh, Maugrange Mader preparation theorem, right? So it's not necessary for what I, I will do next, but maybe I'll just make a comment in such a way that helps me to go to the next slide, which is the following. In this theorem, in order to use preparation theorem, what we need frequently is to look with this model. This model is a finitely generated epsilon n model, clearly. It's just the quotient of two finitely generated epsilon n model. But I need to show in this proof that it is an F star of epsilon p model, which is finitely generated. So the set of map germs with the property that this model is finitely generated was called by mother finitely singularity type. So a singularity F, a germ F is of finite singularity type if and only if this model is finitely generated F star of epsilon P model. But it's not hard to prove if you know a little bit of singularity theory that this is equivalent to say that F is K finitely determined. where K is the contact group. So uh, Mother notes it that using the contact group, he could prove more easily the theorem he was aiming to prove, right? So then he defined the contact group, as Marcelo said in his talk, which is not so easy to define, but it's easy to work with. I will not define, but I will use uh, the invariants that I use, that I need. So the contact group uh, acts on the, the graph of F. And uh, for germs that are k finitely determined, uh, it, uh, it has a complete invariant, which is the local algebra. So given a germ from our n to our p, the local algebra is defined here this question, and uh, it's possible to prove that F and G, if they are finitely determined, they are K equivalent if and only if the algebras are isomorphic. So then, uh, finally, Mother proved this theorem, which shows, shows that for the classification of stable singularities is sufficient to work with the contact group. In other words, it's sufficient to classify the, the local algebras. Theorem says then that if F and G are say infinite stable germs, then F and G are A equivalent if and only if they are K equivalent. So um, this also we can conclude from here that uh, the A orbit is in fact as a risky open set, in the complex case at least, uh, the A orbit is as a risky open set in the K orbit. And uh, you can in fact look at the stratification in jet space using the contact orbits, or in other words, using the algebras, right? 
So this is the summary of uh, this uh, hard theory, but that in fact, I can stratify the jet space using the orbits of the contact group and, and uh, prove my theorem, as I will explain now, um, working with this stratification. So, okay, so let's go to theorem A. This is theorem A, right, by matter. So what mother did? I think uh, it's better if I write here. He proved the following. He defined the set in uh, jet space with the property that this set is minimal, is the minimal Zariski closed set with the property that the complement of the set minimal Zarisk K invariant K K invariant K K invariant set is the property that its complement has a finite number of k orbits. So that this set is the bad set, right? So is, we call the set bad set because it is the minimal set in which modality occurs, right? So it's minimal set with the property that the complement has a finite number of orbits. <laughs> Moreover, he proved that uh, the following properties are verified for this set. That the co-dimension decreases as k increases, And there exists a k sufficiently high such that codimension attains the minimum. The minimum value. So and for this, for this, for this k, we can say that sigma n k n p is equals the codimension of the set for this let me put k0 here so that i can put k0 here okay so how did he prove this in fact he proved this looking at the classification of the algebras because the k orbits are classified by algebras and discovering when the, you really uh, have modality for the classification of the algebras. Okay, so this is what I said. As I said, the bed set is the set of k jets in the space of z, uh, jets of modality greater than or equal to one. The properties as I explained. So, okay. So what is the nice dimension? What we can expect of a, a, a good dimension? I expect that dimension is good if the bed set has co-dimension high. So it's so high that it can be avoided by transversality. Then, um, but before that, before that, I'm sorry. Uh, mother, in fact, he computed the codimension of the set, and uh, we don't we don't need the precise results, of course. But uh, look here that uh, when p equals to n, the codimension of the the set in which modality for the algebras occur is nine. Right? Okay. 
as I said, uh, the nice dimensions are the dimensions for which the codimension of the bed set is bigger than n. Right. So what I have up to now, I have a stratification of the jet space, J, K, and P, uh, which is K invariant, right? And such that this stratification has a set pi K, uh, whose codimension I know how to compute, and its complement has a finite number of K orbits. So if the codimension of the set is bigger than N, this bad set will be missed by maps which are transverse to this stratification, right? And so this is what is here. So then we have a stratification of the jet space, which in the, which in the complement of the bad set has a finite number of K orbits. And uh, of course, I can uh, extend this stratification for the, the whole fiber bundle. Let's just uh, go over this. I mean, because we have the action of the A group on the bundle, so I can extend this, this stratification to the whole bundle and use trans Tone's transversality theorem. Right? So, Tone's transversality theorem says that maps transverse to the stratification form a dense set, of course. But maps transverse to this stratification are stable by the previous mother's results. Right? Okay, so this gives the proof of theorem A. Theorem B is, uh, I will not go into the proof because it's harder. Why it's harder? Theorem B is uh, to prove that topological stability is dense for any pair of dimensions. The idea is similar. So I need one stratification which is invariant by the contact group. But now, since I, I will prove density for all, all pairs of dimensions, of course, the relevant strata, they might be uh, composed by infinite union of algebras, of course. I cannot avoid modality in the stratification. That's the point. So it happens that it's much harder to prove the properties of this stratification. And Mother himself says that what he's do he does in the proof of this theorem is just formalize or complete ideas of Henneton. So Mother proved that this new stratification is uh, Whitney regular in such a way that maps transverse to the stratification. You can pull back the Whitney stratification for the maps and prove that these maps are what we call tone stratified maps and use second isotopy, tone second isotopy theorem in order to prove that maps transverse to that stratification are topologically stable. So this is just the general idea. And what I intend to do now is just uh, explain a little bit more. And this is in order to explain the proof of my theorem of theorem um, one, is explain a little bit more what is this stratification in the boundary of the nice dimension. The boundary of the nice dimensions clearly are the pairs NP such that the codimension of the bed set is N. So if the codimension of the bed set, the bed set, remember, is the set in which the strata, uh, the relevant strata have modality. So if sigma NP has codimension N, that means that the bed set cannot be avoided when I look for maps that are transverse to my stratification, right? So, <clears throat> first of all, we can compute what is the nice dimension just using Mother's formula. And, uh, and then we can find the values of NP for which sigma NP equals N and find as I we saw before this, this curve, right? 
which are the values in the boundary of the nice dimension. So how is the stratification? So, uh, let me just say uh, the name of the strat Tomada stratification, so it be easier to refer to it. So the stratification Tom others, we call Tom others stratification. This is a Whitney regular stratification constructing theorem B, and a map F such that JK is transverse to this stratification. is a Tom Adders map. So theorem B says that Tom Adders map are topologically stable, right? OK. As I said, uh, and to prove our theorem, in order to prove that by Lipschitz stable maps in the boundary of the nice dimensions form a dense set, what we need to do is to completely understand the stratification that we have in the boundary of the nice dimension. But what is this stratification? What is Tom Adder's stratification in the boundary of the nice dimension? We have a strata which are contact orbits, which are K orbits. But uh, we cannot avoid strata which have modality because uh, the co-dimension of the bed set is N. So if you go back to this example, the co-dimension of the algebras in this family, Henneton's family, is uh, the codimension of the, the family is nine. So this strata here made of K orbits, which are equivalent to elements of this family, is, uh, appears generically, right? So, and this is in fact the only, the only strata with modality one that appears in this stratification. So the stratification in dimension 99 is made of k orbits of co-dimension less than or equal to n, and also made by one strata, which is unimodular strata. So in fact, what we are able to do is for each value in the boundary of the nice dimension, this is what happened. We are able to explicit what is the stratification that we have. So, OK, so what happens with maps transverse to Tom Adder stratification? They are topologically stable. They are topologically stable. So to complete the result, we have to prove that this one parameter moduli family, they are Lipschitz trivial. So the last point of the proof is to prove that these families are Lipschitz A-trivial, right? So I know already they are topologically trivial, and we have to prove that they are Lipschitz trivial. So we com complete the proof of theorem one with this proposition. If N is compact, atom mother F from N to P, NP in the boundary of the nice dimensions is a by Lipschitz stable. So take any map transverse to Tom Adder stratification, it's topologically stable, and I know that or it is stable or it is equivalent to this family. And for this family, I explicitly prove that this family is Lipschitz A trivial. In fact, this comes into re results. One result with 
Sorab Trivedi, in which uh, we prove that they are by Lipschitz K trivial. And uh, finally, we prove that they are by Lipschitz A trivial. Just to finish this um, answer to Juan's question, so uh, why uh, we conjecture that the result is sharp, or in other words, if NP is a outside the nice dimension, then uh, by Lipschitz table maps are not dense. Well, if you look, for instance, to this map, which is the unfolding of this family, which gives a topological, this gives a topological stable map from R10 to R9. However, it unfolds this family, which was proved by Henri and Parusinsk that this family's Lipschitz model. So when lambda is different from lambda prime, f lambda is not Lipschitz equivalent to f lambda prime, little f. So it's very likely that this family, which is topologically trivial, cannot be Lipschitz trivial. But we don't have a precise argument. Then you can ask, but so why this uh, one parameter family is, is special? I mean, why you get Lipschitz triviality here? What happens here, at these families are essentially homogeneous. And then when you construct controlled vector fields in order to prove the triviality, in this case, you can prove the, the vector fields are Lipschitz. But in this case, in the other case, no. In this case, the family is weighted homogeneous. And even in the case of little f here, Henri and Parusinsk proved that there is no Lipschitz vector fields tangent to the level sets of this family. Right? So finally, to conclude this, um, this argument, uh, Duplessis and Wall's result is paper. is a very difficult one. I mean, they also, they construct the stratification and they have to analyze invariants of the stratification and to see what are, what invariants are C1 invariants or not. And uh, they prove, for instance, that the second intrinsic derivative is a C1 invariant there. And we see here in this example, that the second intrinsic derivative, which is essentially given by this map F0, varies when lambda varies. So the second intrinsic derivative is not a Lipschitz invariant, right? It's a very hard problem to identify Lipschitz invariants, especially in, in such uh, high dimensional situations, right? So for instance, we don't know whether Tom Boardman varieties are or not by Lipschitz invariants. Well, I'm finishing, I'm, I'm, I will finish a little bit early, but uh, if you, in fact, I present the result in, not in the chronological order. This is uh, more recent, this is a more recent result. The reason why I decided to present this one first it's because, in fact, there are many, many questions, open questions, concerning by Lipschitz stability and also concerning by Lipschitz classification of, of singularities, right? Uh, of course, this problem specifically, it has this um, speciality that uh, it involves very high dimensional situation. But, of course, uh, we can benefit if we understand in general Lipschitz invariance, right? Okay, finally, the second, uh, I will not be able to, to present uh, with details the second problem. I w just want to present the result. Right? This is a very difficult result, in fact. So we proved, as I said, the analog of theorem A, we proved that the subset of one parameter stable families is dense if and only if NP is 
in the what we call externalized dimensions. Uh, the general idea might be is similar to the previous theorems, but it needs a much more deep insight into the classification of singularities of low dimension. Let, but it's similar in the, follow, in the following sense. Let me go to that, uh, that uh, previous example. I have F here and G here, and I have a stable one parameter family. So then it has to cross transversely this uh, codimension higher than zero strata, right? If I want transversality of this uh, red curve to the codimension one strata, of course this has to pass through uh, a uh, orbits which are open in this strata. This only can happen if I don't have a modality in a Zariski open set here, right? So this is the point. I mean, we have to, in, to identif identify pairs in P for which this codimension one strata has no modality, right? I'll just show you the the externalized dimensions. This is the definition of the externalized dimension, but I prefer to show you. So this uh, curve is the boundary of the nice dimensions. In this more internal curve is the boundary of the externalized dimension. So a one-parameter family, a one-parameter stable family, form a dense set if and only if the pair in P is here, right? For instance, when N equals to P, the value at the boundary is 5, 5. Okay, to finish, I, I just want, maybe it's interesting to, to, to tell you this. How we got to this problem was through a completely different road, right? Uh, it was like this. We had a previous paper, Roberta Wicketik and Raul Setzinger, in, uh, in which we defined operations to get new singularities from singularities in lower dimension. This was a continuation of a work started by David Mond and uh, his former student, Roberta, Wicketik and Thomas Cooper, that in 2002, they, uh, they defined the operations in order to, def to define new singularities from singularities in lower dimension. And with their operations, they had been able to classify all a equal dimension one singularities in uh, the nice dimensions. With our work, we had been able theoretically to classify, so we defined new operations and we had been able to, to theoretically to classify a equal dimension to singularities in the nice dimensions. So in, the, what, uh, in that picture, that uh, modal thing, a draw, would give us singularities of at least a equal dimension two because the AE codimension one singularities would be open in that uh, codimension one strata, right? So, and the people start asking us, David Mond asked, Terry Wall asked, are the AE codimension two in the nice dimension simple singularities? And we used to say, yes, they are simple. And we strongly believe that all the A2 codimension, AE dimension two singularities would be simple, right? And we had been able to prove that the answer is yes for core and quant singularities. But we suddenly found one example. 
right? We suddenly found one example of uh, a e codimension to singularity in the nice dimensions, which is not simple. And uh, this comes as a section of this. So we have this stable singularity from R6 to R6. And uh, taking a hyperplane section of this singularity, we had been able to prove that this family here is a modal family. It has each element of the family has a equal dimension too, right? So, and then we start investigating this, uh, this uh, uh, property, and suddenly we realize that we had this picture here, right? This, in fact, this, this is a very deep result. As I said, we had to look very deeply in the classification of singularities. We have no time to talk about this today. Right? I prefer to stop here. Thank you, Cidinha.